Professor Paul Davis, we are very happy to have you here. And uh, here's professor in uh, uh, Arizona State University and wrote several very, very nice books and uh, has a strong career as a scientist and uh, uh, doing outreach of science. And today he uh, will talk about what is life. Uh, it's a question that uh, Schrodinger made in the 40s and uh, he will bring new insights to us for us uh, of this question. So thank you very much for accepting coming to here. Thank you. Well, it's it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. This is the last talk of the meeting, and so I shall try to keep the time. Uh, it's my first time in Rio de Janeiro. Not my first time in Brazil, but first time in Rio. What an amazing city. I went to the beach. What an amazing beach. All those beautiful people crowded together. And what were they doing? They were playing football. Not surprising, this is uh, the week of the World Cup, uh, but I'm here to talk not about football, but about quantum mechanics. They do have one thing in common though, which is mechanics. So 200 years ago, physicists thought of atoms and subatomic particles as like little footballs, uh, but all that changed in the 1920s uh, largely because of the work of this man here, Erwin Schrodinger, and as others have remarked, uh, he is in a sense the founder of this uh, discipline that we might now call quantum biology. Now, uh, quantum mechanics, as it was developed in the 1920s, was immensely successful. It, at a stroke, it explained the nature of matter all the way from uh, nuclear and subatomic particles up to the structure of stars. Uh, but it conspicuously failed to explain the nature of living matter. Now, fast forward 10 years, and uh, Europe was engulfed in the Second World War. And many scientists, including those working in foundations of quantum mechanics, uh, went off to join the war effort. In Schrodinger's case, he went to live in Ireland, in Dublin, which was neutral in the Second World War. Uh, he lived there with his wife and his mistress and his cat, I suppose, uh, all under the same roof, uh, and was able to use that uh, uh, quiet time to uh, indulge his interests in the nature of life. So uh, he, uh, I imagine, I don't know uh, specifically, but I imagine he thought, well, I've explained non-living matter, could I explain living matter? Is quantum mechanics going to play a fundamental role in the nature of living matter? And he gave some lectures at Trinity College in Dublin in 1943 that then became this famous book uh, published in 1944. And according to the folklore, it was very influential with Crick and Watson and uh, Delbrook and others in uh, triggering what we now call the field of uh, molecular biology. So he was a physicist tackling the problem of, of the nature of life. And the essence of it, uh, it's easy enough to explain, can life be explained by physics? Now, if you go to any physics department in the world, you will be told, well, of course, life can be explained by physics. But the critical thing is, is it, can it be explained by known physics, or do we need some new physics? Is there something fundamentally different about living matter that requires new physics. Schrodinger himself was open-minded on this. One must be prepared, he said, to find a new kind of physical law prevailing in it. So I've got to come back to this because it's not just a new physical law, it's a new kind of physical law. And I, for one, think that it is necessary to introduce a new notion of physical law if we're to fully understand the nature of living matter. So, is new physics lurking inside living matter? Um, to a physicist, life seems like magic. In fact, there's a wonderful quote here uh, from uh, Delbrook, 
that says, uh, let me read it out. Um, the curiosity remains to grasp more clearly how the same matter, which in physics and in chemistry displays orderly and reproducible and relatively simple properties, arranges itself in the most astounding fashions as soon as it is drawn into the orbit of the living organism. The closer one looks at these performances of matter in living organisms, the more impressive the show becomes. The meanest living cell becomes a magic puzzle box full of elaborate and changing molecules. I love that idea of uh, living cells as magic puzzle boxes. So uh, what this is essentially saying is at the level of atoms, it is known physics. At the level of cells, it's some sort of magic that we don't fully understand. A little bit more up to date, George Whitesides, the uh, Harvard chemist says, uh, how remarkable is life? The answer is very. Those of us who deal in networks of chemical reactions know of nothing like it. So I think many scientists feel this way that life isn't just another sort of complex system. It does have uh, properties which are uh, baffling, uh, not to say astounding and not fully explained. And I love this uh, video, I hope it'll play as an example, here we go. Um, this is a single celled organism, a paramecium, um, seemingly knowing what it's doing. Um, that's a bit of a leap, but uh, this type of behavior, goal-oriented behavior in something as simple as a single celled organism uh, it is completely astounding. And we look at that, I look at that as a physicist, I think what is going on there? How are we to ever understand such a thing? So in the transition from matter to life, we somehow have to go from physics to biology, somehow have to go from matter to magic. Um, let me list some of the properties of life's magic. Uh, it seems like organisms are self-propelled. They've got a sort of inner, um, uh, inner agenda. Uh, they have goals or purposes. They create order out of chaos. They seem to go against the usual second law of thermodynamics. They're self-organizing. Um, their evolution is important because it's open-ended. You can't put a bound on it. If you look at the history of life on Earth, you can't draw a boundary around it and say it's exploring all possible states in that bounded space. It's an open-ended thing. Um, and life achieves what would otherwise be impossible states. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a good quote from David Deutsch, he who founded the concept of quantum computers. Um, the base metals can be transmuted into gold by stars and by intelligent beings who understand the processes that power the stars, but by nothing else in the universe. Um, so uh, here is not just life, but intelligent life, bringing about an impossible state of affairs. Um, for example, uh, plutonium, uh, when, the, when the Earth formed, it had some plutonium on it because uh, that was part of the solar nebula, but it has a half-life of 70 million years or something, and so it all decayed a long time ago, and there was no plutonium on the Earth until 1943 and then suddenly plutonium appeared because it was made as part of the Manhattan Project. If you went to Mars and found a lump of plutonium there, uh, that would be evidence for extraterrestrial life, extraterrestrial civilization. Um, and so uh, living systems are able to bring into being physical objects, physical systems that couldn't arise in any other way. And so that's one of their uh, extraordinary characteristics. So now, uh, what we're asking at this meeting is quantum mechanics the key to all this? Um, or, as the conventional view holds it, uh, is ball and stick chemistry enough to explain all of biology? Well, there, there is uh, the dawn of quantum biology. I think we uh, all understand that there's um, a community of people uh, convinced that there are uh, some, at least some effects, uh, in, in biology, and this is an article by uh, Philip Ball a few, few years ago. Um, and the, the problem that confronts us is that there's a whole spectrum of different quantum biological phenomena varying on one end from the, the, the plausible to the other end uh, being extremely speculative. And uh, 
an example of the plausible. So John Joe McFadden was talking about proton tunneling in DNA and whether this really does contribute to significantly to mutations or not, we don't know. But as a as a process, proton tunneling in DNA, you know, is not a it, it's it undoubtedly happens. It's the sort of thing we can study and quantify. And that aspect of quantum biology, uh, it's hard to see that anybody could find it objectionable. And at the other extreme, uh, we've got Roger Penrose and Stuart Hammeroff and their uh, contention that consciousness is somehow a quantum phenomenon going on in the brain. Um, and and that's, that's obviously a much more speculative idea. And, and all the way along that spectrum are the different things, many of which we've heard about here at this meeting. And I don't intend to just go back over and list them. You'll, you'll know what they are. Um, this subject, I've been around this subject for quite a while. It's a paper I wrote. I dug it out. I was surprised to see this is 2004. Does quantum mechanics play a non-trivial role in life? Um, I was thinking about, about it since the uh, 1990s. I think I held a workshop in uh, Sydney. I'm still working in Australia uh, in um, round about 2001, 2002. Uh, and uh, uh, in those days, very few people were interested in it. And then here's another paper I wrote just after that about whether whether life, whether quantum mechanics on the one hand, quantum mechanics might play a role in life now, but is did life emerge somehow from the, the quantum realm? Uh, I don't intend to get into the technical details of all this. Um, there was even earlier speculation. Uh, here's a, a paper but from Froelich in uh, 1968, Long Range Coherence and Energy Storage in Biological Systems. Uh, and this has to do with phonons and uh, uh, membranes. Uh, behaving like a Bose-Einstein condensate. So these ideas have been around for a while. In fact, even quantum mechanics in the brain has been around for a while because uh, John Eccles, uh, the, the Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist, thought that there, were, so, there was some sort of quantum tunneling going on in synapses uh, a long time before Penrose became interested in it. So there is a, there is a history. Um, we've had some discussion about, well, all chemistry is quantum mechanical and life is based on chemistry. So surely it's obvious that, that there must be quantum biology. It's a, a trivial statement. But I, I think we there was discussion about this earlier today, um, that we can draw a line between uh, quantum mechanics explaining the shapes and sizes and uh, chemical affinities of molecules and these other types of effects, which we might call non-trivial quantum effects. And I've listed them here. And we've heard earlier uh, about superposition and entanglement being good examples uh, um, and uh, tunneling as well. Uh, all of these things are familiar to quantum physicists, but less familiar to biologists. Um, the uh, accelerated activity, this uh, is has to do with uh, the effect of enzymes and tunneling through uh, through barriers to greatly increase the uh, the rate of uh, reactions. Uh, there are other rather more abstract things as well, uh, such as the homochirality of uh, life as we know it, which ultimately would have had a quantum mechanical uh, explanation. So there's, there's these uh, various things that we can list. Um, what's the key question I think that confronts us is, the, the type of things we've been talking about, you know, the avian compass and uh, olfactory response of Drosophila and so on, um, are these just a few quantum quirks? Are they just um, uh, oddities that life has discovered? Or are they the tip of a quantum iceberg uh, that is uh, that ultimately says that quantum mechanics is essential for explaining that non-trivial quantum mechanics is essential for explaining life. This is the big question. So there are five views you can take on this. The first is the conventional one, uh, which we would find most of our colleagues uh, in biology departments would, would say, which is all biology needs is just classical ball and stick concepts. Uh, then there's another point of view. Uh, I think Gabriella really gave an example of this. Um, quantum-inspired 
concepts apply may apply to life. In other words, we may think about uh, aspects of life drawing inspiration from quantum mechanics. That is, uh, we may uh, use the conceptual framework of quantum mechanics, but ultimately uh, we can find classical analogs that will explain it very well. There was a good example of that um, a about 10 years ago when a, a Purva Patel from India uh, thought that uh, Grover's algorithm of quantum computing might apply uh, to the to uh, genetics, uh, the way the numbers seem to come out uh, about right, um, and and since convinced himself that uh, doesn't actually need quantum mechanics uh, that that you can have um, classical wave like phenomena would achieve the same result. But quantum mechanics can often be a way of thinking about the world and a way of thinking about life uh, that could be fruitful, even if ultimately it um, we find classical analogs that are perfectly satisfactory. So that's the next position. Uh, and then we go to the position that I just uh, indicated, which is that here and there are effects in biology which really do need these non-trivial quantum, uh, quantum mechanics going on, um, but they're not critical to life's operation. They're just sort of incidental little features, um, much like in biology, it's full of funny little features like the elephant's trunk. Um, they're not essential to the nature of life, but they're sort of interesting uh, embellishments. Um, and then we could go to the position that uh, although life is mainly classical, uh, that some really critical, some vital processes depend on quantum mechanics in a non-trivial way. So that if we didn't have quantum mechanics, we wouldn't have life. And then we could go to a really extreme position, which is even going beyond quantum mechanics, that, uh, that life is truly weird and it won't ever be explained without, um, even with quantum mechanics, it'll require some sort of post-quantum mechanics or quantum physics applied to, uh, to systems of high complexity and so forth uh, that uh, that will be really necessary, and you can you can be anywhere on this uh, on this spectrum. Um, now, there's uh, I've really alluded to this already. There are really two ways that quantum mechanics can play a role in life. One is a negative effect. So, quantum mechanics is of course limiting qu quantum noise uh, uh, is 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 ever present and can disrupts the fidelity of any sort of complex system. Um, and so one way quantum mechanics could be relevant to life is as a barrier. It uh, may, may be that life evolves towards this quantum edge and it can't go beyond because of the disruptive effects of quantum mechanics. So that's the negative aspect. The uncertainty, the indeterminism could be disruptive to life's project. Um, on the other hand, there could be a positive effect, which is where life harnesses quantum effects to achieve an advantage of some sort. And it's had three and a half billion years on Earth, and who knows how, how much longer beyond Earth, um, to uh, use Darwinian evolution to discover whether there is some advantage in harnessing these quantum effects. So if there is an increase in performance, it doesn't have to be more than a few percent here and there. You would expect life to actually evolve um, a, a mechanism for dealing with that. So uh, the, these are two quite contrasting ways. Um, let me just mention one example. Uh, this, uh, I, don't, I don't think we've heard about this work at uh, this uh, particular meeting. Um, this is the work of Gabo Vate <laughs> in um, Hungary. Uh, this is quantum criticality at the origin of life. And the, um, the key point here, the claim is, that when you take biologically relevant molecules, um, cytochrome C, for example, is one they, they look at, uh, and you look at the um, electron transport properties through those molecules, uh, they have their electrical properties, the tunneling uh, is very distinctive, and I'll just read the summary of that. Uh, in this paper, we show that practically all biomolecules, from small signaling molecules to proteins, taking part in biochemical electronic processes belong to a fundamentally new class of conducting material. This is a disordered conductor where the strength of the disorder is tuned exactly 
to the metal insulator transition point, and it's consequently in a permanent critical quantum state. So the claim is that biologically relevant molecules have evolved to have these un unusual and distinctive electrical properties. And I'm talking about the uh, 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 electron tunneling through these molecules. Uh, and uh, they point out uh, that, um, that having such a property uh, um, is, uh, if, if you wanted it by chance, if you wanted to just shuffle amino acids and get a polymer uh, with random amino acids, uh, that there would be uh, almost no chance at all, astronomically low probability of finding this particular critical uh, quantum critical condition. So maybe this is evidence that life has indeed evolved and is selecting these key quantum effects uh, in order to um, achieve its ends. Um, let me just turn to, you know, why are we wasting our time worrying about these things? Um, why should we care? Uh, the question, what is life? Um, and the truth is uh, that it's uh, worth a lot of money to know the answer. And what I'm showing you here is uh, the moon Enceladus, which is a, a moon of Saturn. And the plumes that you see squirting out there uh, come from the inside of this moon. It's an icy moon. It's got an icy crust. Uh, but as it orbits Saturn, the tidal friction keeps the, the material beneath the surface liquid. And the Cassini mission uh, determined that these plumes contain organic molecules. And so some astrobiologists are excited by the idea that, that maybe there's life uh, beneath this icy crust and it's spearing out in these plumes uh, as if uh, it's offering free samples. All we got to do is go there uh, and uh, fly through it and see what's there. And so there is a mission being planned uh, by NASA to fly through the plumes. And you'll notice the dollar signs there uh, because of course it's, uh, there's a lot of money um, being spent to see, to sample this material. And of course the question is, what do you look for? How would you know? Uh, organic molecules on their own are not enough uh, to indicate life. How can you discriminate uh, between uh, something that was living but got sort of mashed up and something that isn't uh, quite yet living uh, or was never living, uh, and does that have any meaning anyway? Can we ever build a life meter? If you wanted to go to Enceladus and say, does it have a magnetic field? Uh, well, you, you'd go to a physics lab and they build you a magnetometer and it would measure the magnetic field, but we don't have anything that can measure life, lifeness. There's no measure of life. There is, there's nothing, if I say to you that Enceladus has been sitting there uh, for four and a half billion years, uh, it's, a, it's a, a rich chemical soup of organic molecules. It's been trying to incubate life. Um, and if I said, well, uh, it didn't quite do it, but it did get 93% of the way there. You know, a, a, a spacecraft flies through the plume and it's, it sends back the data. No, no life on Enceladus, but it was almost there, got 93% of the way there. That's a ridiculous statement. I think we all recognize you can't quantify life in that sort of way. We don't know almost life. We wouldn't recognize almost life if we saw it. We recognize life and we recognize when something's clearly not living. But, but the idea that, that there is a sort of sliding scale, uh, Richard Dawkins has this nice metaphor of Mount Improbable, climbing Mount Improbable, and it works very well for the, the history of evolution. You start out with simple organisms, you climb Mount Improbable to more and more complex, uh, and that's the essence of Darwinian evolution. But there's a prebiotic Mount Improbable that you've got to go from a mishmash of chemicals to the immense complexity of a truly living thing. And that wouldn't have happened in one great leap. There would be a pathway of chemical compl complexification. Um, and we have no idea what that pathway was or how to measure how far along that you're getting it because nature doesn't start out by thinking, well, I must make life. And so the, I must keep going down this pathway and at the end I will achieve life. It doesn't happen that way. So we don't even know how to think about it. We don't know what to measure going through, uh, through the plume. There are some biosignatures which are obvious, like homochirality would be a good one, based on life as we know it. 
but we don't really have a definition of life. And that's what makes it so hard to think about these, these subjects. Now, let me just move on. Um, there's more to the problem than just um, how do we characterize the chemical complexity of living things. There really is a conceptual gulf here. If you go to a physics department uh, and say, well, what is life? You'll be given a detailed account of, uh, of um, the forces and molecular sh shapes and sizes and chemical affinities and so on, uh, a detailed account of life in those terms, uh, in terms of stuff, if you like. But if you ask uh, biologists what is life, they're going to give you a story about um, uh, genetic instructions and encryption and genetic code and translation. And, uh, and now uh, editing, of course, uh, gene editing is uh, very much a new technology. Uh, in other words, biologists think of life in terms of information. Physicists think of it in terms of stuff. It, it is, of course, both. Um, and it, this information is not just limited to the obvious one, which is the information stored on DNA is like the code book of life. I think we all know that, um, but uh, uh, genes just don't exist in isolation. They form complex networks that switch each other on and off, uh, and information swirls around these networks, uh, sometimes of great complexity. Uh, and even when we get to simple living things like bacteria, they can form complex colonies like biofilms, cooperative uh, activity uh, by exchanging information with each other. So we've got information flowing, as it were, horizontally from DNA into uh, proteins and then and vertically through inheritance. And then we've got information flowing around gene networks in complex ways or signals between uh, organisms like bacteria. And then when we go to more complex organisms, uh, it uh, gets richer and richer. So uh, ants, for example, engage in collective decision-making. So there's a picture, uh, we don't know what they're talking about, it might be some sporting fixture or something, uh, they, but but they uh, they literally put their heads together. Uh, or we think of birds, um, the coordination of bird flocks. The, perhaps the most exquisite example of information in biology is embryogenesis, the way the embryo forms uh, uh, un, unfolding uh, according to very precise choreography. So all the right bits are in the right places at the right time. Uh, and, and all of this is under uh, control of um, of information networks. And then there's this uh, big information processor between our ears. Uh, obviously, that's important, but it goes on even beyond individual organisms. Uh, so my colleagues at ASU uh, did this map. So it doesn't show very well. Uh, 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 this is a global map of uh, genomes and biochemical reactions that all connect to each other on a planetary scale. And what I like to say is that the biosphere is the original World Wide Web. So it's a web of information. So we think of, of life as a sort of veneer of green stuff on the surface of the earth. I think of it as a veneer of information. Now, um, this idea that uh, information is the key to understanding life, it's certainly not, uh, not my idea. So Paul Ness, uh, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, head of the Crick Institute in London, uh, wrote this very nice article in Nature. And again, I will read the quotation. Uh, we need to describe the molecular interactions and biochemical transformations that take place in living organisms and then translate these descriptions into the logic circuits that reveal how information is managed. This analysis should not be confined to the flow of information from gene to protein, but should also be applied to all functions operating in cells and organisms. In other words, we think about uh, living organisms as uh, in, in these modules that carry out logical operations that are wired together uh, in circuits uh, that can control what is going on. And it's this aspect of management or control that I think I find um, so compelling about, uh, the, about the nature of living organisms. It's not just information, information storage or information processing, it's information control. Now, I'm gonna to have to speed up a bit. Um, so it's a popular definition of life, it's in information plus chemistry. Uh, it's exactly that. What we'd like to know at this meeting uh, is in connection with that information, is it all just about bits? 
or is it also about qubits? Uh, is it possible that um, there is uh, quantum information processing, at least in part, going on inside living organisms? Let me just say a few words about what is information. Uh, for those of you that um, may not know the history of this, uh, people still ask this question, as you can see, what exactly is it? Um, the philosopher Gregory Bateson said that information is a difference that makes a difference. Um, unless, unless information makes a difference to the world, it's a redundant concept. But it does seem to make a, a difference. Um, and a very austere definition of information is um, it's that which enables us to predict better than chance. And this was the basis of uh, Claude Shannon's information theory developed in the late 1940s. And I'll just quickly go through this. Um, he introduced the notion of the bit or the binary digit, very simple idea. You toss a coin, may come down heads, may come down tails. If you don't look, you lack that information. There's some uncertainty. If you look, that uncertainty is reduced. Uh, and in this case, it goes from two possibilities down to one. And so that's one bit of information. That's the, the definition, reduction in uncertainty. Um, well, uh, that's all very well. That seems like an abstract concept, but can information make a difference in the world? How is it we can talk about information flows, information networks in biology as explaining the way living matter behaves? How does information gain physical purchase over living matter? Uh, well, we don't Probably no, we don't really understand. But it's uh, the idea that information has physical effects uh, goes back a long way. First of all, it's just a picture showing this is the, the I don't know if you're familiar with this picture. This is uh, a portion of intermediary metabolism. It's a map of that. Some people call this a ridiculogram. Um, and, and what we want to know is how do those chemical networks, how do information networks couple to those chemical networks? Um, but the idea that, that information has physical clout goes back to Maxwell's demon. So Maxwell, in a letter to a friend in 1867, uh, drew attention to the idea that if you had this, um, uh, this little being in a box of gas divided by a membrane uh, with a shutter mechanism, uh, then if this uh, being could see the molecular motions, could then operate the shutter to let all the fast molecules go in one direction, all the slow molecules go in the other direction. And in principle, this could be done without expending any energy because it's just a matter of opening and closing a, a frictionless gate. Uh, and so uh, the result of that would be to build up a temperature difference between the two halves of the box. And then you could run uh, some sort of heat engine from it and extract work. So here was a means of turning heat into work with no other change, violating the cherished second law of thermodynamics. That became known as Maxwell's demon. So what the demon is doing is in effect, transferring heat from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir uh, in defiance of the second law. So normally, uh, you know, if you have put a snow, snowman or snow person, I suppose, I should call it, by a fire, you wouldn't expect the snow to expand and the fire to go out, you would expect the fire to, to melt the snow. However, you might be thinking, what about a refrigerator? Uh, this is, in fact, a picture of my refrigerator. Uh, doesn't a refrigerator do exactly that? Doesn't it uh, take heat from a cold region and pump it into the warm kitchen? Um, yes, it does. But I pay an electricity bill for that to happen. In other words, there's a price to be paid to go against the thermodynamic gradient. Well, Maxwell Steeman was able to do that, not using electricity, but using information. And that suggests that information is a type of fuel and you could use it to run a motor. And this is now something of a cottage industry, information as fuel. Uh, this is uh, my favorite uh, machine that runs on information. It's an information powered refrigerator of all things. And uh, it's a nano piece of nanotechnology. Uh, this is uh, Yuka Pekola in uh, Finland. And, um, uh, and there are now a number of devices that convert information into work. 
uh, sometimes with great efficiency. There's a whole lot of papers uh, uh, d discussing this. Um, so Maxwell's demon, which was a thought experiment at the time, is now part of real technology. In fact, the first Maxwell demon was actually made in Edinburgh, the, the uh, city of Maxwell's birth, about 200 years uh, after his birth. Um, and now uh, here we have uh, papers about um, uh, information as fuel. And so um, what am I saying? I'm saying that, um, that with Maxwell Demon type devices, one can play, it, you can't violate the second law of thermodynamics for all sorts of technical reasons I'm not going to get into now, but you can play the margins of it. Uh, gain, you can gain advantage by playing the margins of the second law of thermodynamics with demon like uh, entities. And it's no surprise that life discovered demons like this a long time ago. Um, and these molecular machines are really, many of them are in effect. Maxwell demons. The one that comes in my mind closest to the original concept is the voltage gated ion channel. This has come up already in discussion here. Um, one proton, one ion at a time goes through the channel. Um, and the way this works, so you get the, um, uh, the way the wave travels down an axon, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the, um, in the membrane, there are these holes, and uh, they open up, and these ions can go through one way or the other. And uh, uh, and there isn't an actual demon there, but it's a, the, but the information about the wave is there, and this leads to the transfer of ions either inside or outside the um, the the membrane. And so we see these demon-like things going on in life all the time. Um, but there are a lot of questions uh, left unanswered here because it's very clear that biological information uh, is not just, as it were, any old bits of information. It's got these very special qualities. Um, and when I say that, it's, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, people will often say, well, uh, in chemistry, we see examples of self-organization leading to complexity. And it's true, this is the famous belosov shabatinsky reaction. Uh, and uh, Ilya Prigogin was convinced that the secret of life was driving systems far from thermodynamic equilibrium, and they would then self-organize into more and more complex states. But I think that's an ex example of what life doesn't do. I think um, the key point about life is that the information is that, they, that it's not spontaneous self-organization. An embryo doesn't uh, grow by spontaneous self-organization. It's supervised or managed organization. And that management is under the control of um, uh, information, which is not just stored in bits. It has what we might uh, think of as a semantic or contextual uh, aspect to it. Uh, the, uh, I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, you take a gene. What is a gene? It's a, a sequence of base, base pairs on DNA, which codes for a protein, which has biological functionality. If you uh, just shuffle the base pairs, uh, what you've then got is junk DNA. It's got the same number of bits of information, but it's biologically useless. It doesn't do anything. It's meaningless, has no managerial properties. And so the thing about biological information is it's not just Shannon bits. It's got other qualities, and those qualities depend on the, the global or the contextual uh, uh, arrangement. So uh, the, the reason that a particular sequence of base pairs in DNA uh, is significant as a gene is because there's a molecular system, like a ribosome and all the rest, that can interpret those instructions and implement them uh, to perform part of, of life's project. So it's only in that context that biological information works. And so we, we have, we, we, we need to try to develop a notion of contextual or uh, managerial uh, information. And, and really nobody, I mean, there are, only, there are one or two philosophers who've tried to do this, but we really don't know at this stage.
uh, how am I doing for time? No, no, I must move on. Um, the uh, the genetic code, uh, I think, is a great puzzle because here we have the fact that biological information is encrypted. Uh, and how did this code arise in the first place? Uh, we don't know. Um, uh, the, the big problem here is that the notion of um, coded information uh, uh, the, and the notion of instructions, coded instructions, seems to come from the realm of human discourse. Uh, people can can give instructions to each other uh, in uh, in code, um, and and that's a meaningful sort of thing. But how how could this happen uh, among molecules? How did molecules write uh, code in the first place? How did all this arise? I don't think we know. I don't think we even know how to think about it. Um, there's obviously an effect of top-down causation here because uh, when I said that uh, information management means that there has to be a, a global system that can interpret and act upon uh, the, uh, the information stored uh, in the DNA. Uh, well, there are many examples of uh, top-down causation in in biology, and I just want to give a few to show how puzzling this is, uh, that physical forces can affect gene expression. Um, and let me just mention the work of um, Michael Levin uh, at Tufts University. I don't know why that's ringing. Nothing to do with me. Okay. Um, and we heard about this yesterday um, uh, from Wendy Bean about these, uh, these flatworms. Um, now, what uh, Mike Levin uh, can do. So um, e each uh, cell has a, a voltage across the membrane, uh, sort of resting potential, uh, and uh, that varies from cell type to cell type. Uh, and you can map that. Uh, there are dyes that enable you to map the distribution of, uh, of those potentials, the polarization across uh, the cell membrane. And this is a map showing uh, the, the um, uh, the pattern uh, of uh, that distribution in in uh, these uh, flatworms, planaria. Um, and uh, what Levin can do uh, with certain molecules is to change those potentials. So he can rewrite the electrical patterning. And as a result of being able to do that, he can grow worms with uh, two heads or with two tails. They develop differently. So. Um, if you chop, uh, if you chop a, 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 a planaria worm in two like that, the, head, the new head will grow a tail, and the new tail will grow a head. We learned about this yesterday. Um, but here's the astonishing thing: um, if he uh, interferes with the electro electrical patterning around the wounds, uh, he can then produce uh, two-headed worms and two-tailed worms. These would look like different species to a visitor from Mars because um, their, their morphology is so different, but they have identical DNA, just that different genes are being expressed. But the really mind-blowing thing is what happens if you chop up a two-headed worm? Do you, do you go back to the normal phenotype? Well, you don't. You make two two-headed worms, and the same thing with two-tailed worms. In other words, the phenotype is propagated one generation to the next, uh, even though they have identical genes. And um, and this raises the whole question about how is this uh, bioelectric memory propagated? Where is that information stored? And is there a mathematical code? Um, this is an example of epigenetic uh, information transmission from one generation to the next. There's a, a further quirky aspect to this is um, if uh, he did experiment chopping out the, or his colleagues did an experiment chopping out the middles of uh, a lot of worms, sent them to the space station, uh, and when they came back, about 15% of them were two-headed. Um, and there was some discussion earlier today about gravitational effects. So if you uh, try to uh, get get these worms to develop in microgravity, then their gene expression is different from what it would be uh, down here in, in normal gravity. Um, 
And so what that tells us is that uh, physical forces can affect gene expression, can affect the way that organisms uh, de develop and behave. And these forces can be mechanical, electrical, or as we had yesterday, magnetic, or they can be gravitational. Uh, and uh, good, a good example of mechanical effect uh, is called contact in inhibition. If you grow healthy cells in a Petri dish, uh, when they reach the boundary, they stop growing. There's the signal that switches, uh, switches off the growth um, because of their mechanical environment. Uh, cancer cells turn that off so they can go on uh, proliferating uh, even though there are, there are barriers. Um, and so uh, elect electrical forces or mechanical forces like this can actually affect the way cells develop and differentiate. So stem cells, in the cancer community, there's a, a phrase people use, I, I am what I touch. So uh, stem cells, if they're on a hard surface, will differentiate into different uh, uh, final form than if they're in a soft tissue environment, for example. So we know that there's a lot of this top-down um, control going on where the physical environment over the whole system is exerting an effect on the way the uh, the cells develop, the way the genes get switched on and off. Uh, so if we're to fully understand life and the physics of life, we have to understand it not just in its bottom-up context, but its top-down context as well. I'm getting near to the end, you'll be pleased to know. Um, lots of questions. Uh, I've said uh, already, is there an electrical code to go alongside the genetic code? How is that information stored and transmitted in, in the worm experiments? Does quantum mechanics play a role in that, uh, as it does in Schrodinger's aperiodic uh, crystal? Is there some equivalent uh, for this electrical story that we can't understand how that epigenetic information is propagated without quantum mechanics? Um, and uh, uh, Mike Levin wants to, um, uh, to, to apply these ideas of bioelectricity to things like uh, treating cancer or correcting uh, birth defects or repairing tissues. These are all possibilities because if you can use electricity, uh, to put it crudely, uh, to control uh, development or limb regeneration uh, or tissue architecture, uh, then that opens up all sorts of new uh, technological and medical possibilities. Um, let me come back to this uh, point of view, can life be explained by known physics or do we need some sort of new laws of life? Um, and the possibility that there really is some new physics lurking in living matter. Um, I, I think there might be, uh, and, and there is an idea that I have played around with, and I haven't left enough time to explain it in detail, but I just want to put it, uh, just give you the, the essence of it. Um, it's a new kind of physical law, and it's uh, basically state-dependent dynamics. Now, ever since the time of Newton, we've, we're used to the idea of fixed laws uh, and changing dynamical states, that the laws of physics are fixed, no matter how violent, uh, or complicated the phenomena are, the laws themselves don't change. Even under gravitational collapse, the laws are fixed laws. And that's been the way we've thought about it ever since. But fixed laws aren't a good fit in uh, biosystems. Uh, instead, uh, some, so some people think, well, maybe there are time-dependent laws, but it's not so much that they're time-dependent. They, I think that the laws which apply in living organisms at any given time are really a function of the state of that organism. And that's uh, just to give you an example of what I mean. Um, we, we did a computer study uh, involving cellular automata, where the in, in cellular automata, the update rules are usually fixed. So in one dimensional cellular automata, there are 256 update rules that Stephen Wolfram uh, famous uh, and you can uh, you can play with those cellular automata what we wanted to do was have um, an example of a, a one-dimensional cellular automaton in which the update rules uh, were changing as a function of the overall state of the whole automaton just to give you a very trivial example if um, there were an even number of pixels uh, filled 
at a particular time, then you might rule, uh, use rule 38. If they're an odd number, you might rule, use rule 52. Um, we, we did something more sophisticated than that. But the point is that we found that by having not having fixed rules, but having this feedback between the state of the system and the dynamics driving the system, uh, this was a pathway, uh, a new pathway to complexity, a new type of evolution, uh, novel forms of complexity that could not arise. I come back to this idea that life does things which are impossible uh, any other way, that could not arise uh, in any other way by fixed rules. So it opens up a whole new possibility space uh, by having these state-dependent rules. Um, if you still don't see what I'm driving at, let me give you an analogy in terms of, of uh, chess. Um, so the game of chess is normally played with fixed rules, um, but imagine that you have something I like to call chess plus, um, and this is for, for people who are where the, where the play is uneven. Um, and supposing, I'll give you a silly example, but it just shows what I mean. So supposing, um, white is losing by some criterion, uh, then maybe white is able to move pawns backwards as well as forwards. That would give a slight advantage. So the rules have changed according to the overall state of play. Um, and then if you carry that idea forward, so what it, what it means is the following. Let me just try and make this more precise. Um, there are a vast number of different configurations of the pieces on the board. But if you just put the pieces on the board at random and said, can I play backwards uh, to the standard starting configuration? The answer is no. In almost all cases, you wouldn't get there. In other words, although there is a huge number of possible configurations or, or possible games, it's still only a tiny fraction of the total number of uh, configurations on the board. Uh, and so if you have this sort of chess plus arrangement, uh, you may end up with something like this, and you have to look rather carefully to think, well, what's wrong? This is an impossible state of affairs uh, by fixed rules because it's got two bishops on the same color. So you see what I'm driving at, that if you allow the update rules, the dynamics, to depend on the overall state of the system, you can then achieve new states, which would not be achievable in any other way. Um, I need to just bring this to a conclusion. Uh, I just wanted to point out that if this seems bizarre to you, the idea of um, state-dependent uh, dynamics, uh, we already know one very good example of it in, in standard quantum mechanics. If a system is um, isolated, it evolves by unitary evolution. Uh, if you make a measurement, it's uh, 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 it, uh, the wave function collapses, you project out an, an eigenstate, uh, according to the Born rule. So the rule that you apply when it's isolated is uh, Schrodinger's equation, um, unitary evolution. The rule you apply when you make a measurement is Born's rule, two different rules depending on the global circumstances. When you make a measurement, there's a measuring apparatus, it's a downward top-down causation thing as well. So a very good example from physics we're all comfortable with of a state-dependent rule of, uh, that shows top-down causation. And I'm suggesting that something like that is, is going on in biology as well. Whether it's quantum or not, I, I don't know. Um, but, but certainly that concept of state dependence, I think, is an important one. Um, I just want to finish with a, a, a quote from Einstein. Uh, well, the quote uh, at the top is uh, from my colleague Sarah Walker, biology is the next great frontier of physics. But Einstein, uh, of course, famously said one can best feel in dealing with living things, how primitive physics still is. And so I think that's a good place to stop, except if you want to know more about all this top-down causation and uh, information management and so on, then do go and buy my book, The Demon in the Machine. Uh, and I've left four minutes for, for, for questions. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. They're all struck dumb. So, ah. I have a comment more than a question. Um, I think that the way you ended the talk somehow gives a hint to some of the questions that you asked. And the reason being because, well, um, 
you said that quantum mechanics has two different rules or to deal with dynamics. I would claim that it, it is still one theory. So it's one set of rules together, but it contains exactly because of this partition that you made of two different rules, it contains its own limitation which is the fact that like it still requires you somehow to define this boundary to deal with these two parts of the dynamics and in that sense it its limitations will certainly um, propagate when you try to, ex to to exploit it or you try to expand it to to, to explain other things in that sense I would hint, well, I would think, I would guess that it's impossible to try to describe biology in general without dealing with quantum mechanics for the simple reason that like it's the best theory that we have to explain everything microscopic. But at the same time, quantum mechanics is limited. So uh, I wouldn't expect it to 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 allow it to emerge on its own much more complex uh, concepts just because of this, this limitation of having to fix boundaries and things like that. But, but now everything you said could also apply to other complex systems that would not be living. And what we're trying to do, what we're struggling with here is to try to see, you know, life does seem very distinctive in its properties. It's got got these magical qualities that we somehow would like to understand them in terms of physics and what is the physics going on and do we need new physics and it's true I mean I agree with you uh, quantum mechanics has to apply but um, is it on its own enough uh, and in particular the way that information has this managerial role which I think is really the key point about about life it's not just it's it's not just stored bits of information. It's uh, it's information that can uh, exercise control over over the system, and I and I don't even know how to think about that. And whether that's fundamentally quantum mechanical or not, I wouldn't like to say. It might be. Paul, well, thank you so much for it was a delight. Um, I'd like to ask a broad question about um, systems that um, decrease local entropy life, right? For example, they have this continuous um, reduction of entropy, local entropy by increasing, you know, overall entropy. How do they essentially differ from non-organic uh, systems, non-living systems that eventually have local reductions in entropy is there anything to say about that? well yes you see i'll come back to that um uh the belosov shabatinsky reaction so so Prigogine felt that life um it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics it exists at far from equilibrium uh with a throughput uh, he called, called it a dissipative system there's a throughput of uh, of matter and energy and an export of entropy so that the system is far from equilibrium is generating a lot of entropy but it itself um, is uh, uh, in a lower entropy state than its environment it's pushing all the entropy out into its environment um, and what that was lacking was this idea of information management uh, that, um, that the patterns another simple example is the um, uh, Bainar instability, you heat a fluid from underneath and uh, it's at a certain critical temperature difference, you get a convection pattern, you get these hexagonal convection cells uh, spontaneously appear. But that's not the way embryos develop. They don't develop just by things spontaneously appearing. They appear, it's choreographed. The, the appearance of this structure is under the control of a network of, of information, information flow, information storage and the information does something i mean it's not just it's got a couple somehow to the chemistry and make sure that those that that patterning uh is uh, preordained it's not just spontaneous it's uh 
it's it's very different. I think there is this this is the key point about life that it's uh, information in this managerial role. And where I can see quantum mechanics coming in is that you get uh, because of these far from equilibrium systems, you get these critical points where uh, the system might sort of leap on this branch or that branch, uh, or the um, the patterns in the chemical reaction might occur in this position or that position. Uh, you're amplifying a lot of microscopic fluctuations to produce the macroscopic pattern. But if you have quantum information or um, information controlling quantum processes or something of that nature at the microscopic level, then that could precisely become amplified up to uh, to a macroscopic scale. So I think quantum mechanics could play a key role in that in, in development uh, and uh, the pattern formation there because of the, uh, the, the, the fact that the patterns that, uh, that grow are exquisitely sensitive to the molecular conditions. So that, I mean, that, that only just occurred to me that this could be an important part of future quantum biology. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when you think of a spaceship co coming too quickly to the atmosphere, it can bump on the atmosphere. The yeah. atmosphere looks like a solid. Yes. And uh, you think of a root of a tree. It goes so slowly that uh, it can break uh, solid concrete and go like a fluid. Yes. It could be that our perception of light, uh, life is actually related to time. It's related to the time the processes happen and the way we perceive it. You mean that... Uh, uh... Do you mean that it needs a, a long period of time for us to see uh, the distinction between? Yeah, let's imagine a, a, a big giant, infinite giant that looks at our universe and think the universe is alive or somehow just because of the time the processes happen and the way you perceive that thing happening. Uh, right. But if, again, if we come back to this idea that information is the, the distinctive feature of life, then the time scale for that information processing uh, uh, is is obviously critical. We see many many time scales within living organisms, uh, like how long, do, you know, how long does it take to generate a thought? You know, might be uh, a second or something. Uh, but then we've got information processing uh, uh, on a molecular scale much faster than that, uh, and um, and then when you, we get to human society, then it's a much longer time. And then if we think, could there be a galactic civilization? Well, then it's limited by the speed of light. So I often say that uh, that if the galaxy is alive or it's thinking, then it uh, would be an uh, incredibly intelligent but very slow-witted entity because it would take a very long time to have a thought. Uh, so... Yeah, the time scale for information processing is important. I don't know whether we can actually use that to try to define life. In other words, that is life defined to be information processing on a certain time scale? Is that the way we do it? I, I haven't really thought about it in those terms. Uh, don't have anything more to say on that subject. Yes. Yeah, I have a, another comment or question regarding the DNA and arrangement of, of, of the, the bases and so on, wouldn't it be, or couldn't it be a matter of uh, res rescaling in the sense that if I consider my alphabet to be ACTG, then yes, it's true that like out of all the possible combinations that I have, it's very, very few of them will work. But I can also consider that the same way that language, if I consider A, B, C, D, uh, right. my, as, as my main, main structure, then randomly I do not communicate. But we are communicating because out of all the possible uh, arrangements, only a few of them have been agreed upon between us. Right. And, and then I can ask if nature also does this, rescales information in the sense that... Uh, uh, out of trying 
lots of possible combinations. Nature actually found a few of them that those are the ones that work. And this is my new alphabet. So this is the alphabet that I'm going to use from now on. And then you apply rules like entropy reduction and so on. But for this new specified selected alphabet. Uh, something before you, you address that. Yes. I, I, I was actually um, thinking of something related. As a university professor, I teach basic biochemistry. So I, I go from evolution, molecular origins of life, all the way up to organisms. And I try to convince my students, and I think most of my colleagues that do the same, uh, that life is really a random selection of uh, amongst various choices that happen to be there at a given time. And that's how proteins come to be. But the one thing that I, I always feel some sort of imposter syndrome, if you will, uh, about teaching them and trying to convince them is about the genetic code. Because yeah. I don't really, it's very disquieting to me how it comes to be that molecules can actually create a code yes. to talk to other molecules. Right. So I don't, I don't grasp this. So I had a slide there making exactly that point, how do, how do molecules write code? I don't understand it. And of course, um, to, just to address the previous question, uh, applying that specifically to the code, uh, there's a staggeringly huge number of different codes that uh, that life could use. And all life on Earth uses more or less the same code. And opinions differ as to whether this has evolved because it's the most efficient code or whether it's a frozen accident. Uh, and I don't think there's a consensus on that at the moment. But the very existence of a code, of coded information channel, uh, coming, coming into existence, digitized coded information, coming into existence spontaneously uh, in a chemical mixture. I think I find this very, very, I think it's the, the I, for me, the problem, the origin of life is really the origin of coded information, uh, information management. I get, and I keep coming back to that. It's not just storing information or transmitting it. It's information management. It's about control because that's the thing about living organisms that they're not spontaneous. They're controlled. Their agenda is under under control, um, and to a physicist trying to to get uh, a mathematical description of what managerial information might be, or semantic information, or contextual information, it's clearly something that relates the local to the global, the system as a whole. When we're talking about living organisms and biological functionality and survival, that's the system as a whole. Uh, and yet the information is stored at the local level. So it's that whole part relationship that is so difficult uh, for a physicist to understand. We like to think of be reductionists and think of things as the whole is no more than the sum of the parts, but it clearly isn't the case in, in biology. Cool. I, have, I, have, I also have a comment. I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment has to do um, with the fact that some of us in the spin community, we think that uh, some of Mike Levin's results are consistent with being explained by a spin model under under the hood. Oh, and uh, uh, just to 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 share with everyone that uh, actually um, we. We're having a mini meeting between the spin people and Mike Levin and some other people from the regeneration field, and I, I shall report what we learn from that. So I think that's super cool, and 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 I do think that a lot of things that uh, folks in the regeneration field is are seeing might be consistent with with being di driven by spins, but th that's another thing. So my question is, what according to you, what's the mo the, the strongest relevance, the, the strongest experimental result consistent with quantum phenomena being at use by nature? Well, I've, uh, uh, of course, I followed all of the famous ones like the avian compass and so on. Um, and, uh, uh, but the one that, that really made me pay attention was uh, the, that result of Gabor Vate uh, for the reason that um, Stuart Lindsay at ASU works uh, on um, well, nanopore technology, uh, uh, sequencing uh, uh, through, through electron tunneling uh, 
uh, Currens, and he uh, reproduced some of those results, and he said it was truly astonishing. He could take a peptide uh, that would have certain conductance properties, change one amino acid, and it's like throwing a switch. Um, and uh, the idea that life has selected, I mean, for reasons I can't even guess at, why would it care? Uh, apart from the fact that electron transport is clearly an important part of life, but but for most molecules, they're not part of the electron transport chain. Uh, why does it matter? Why do they have to have those properties? Uh, I don't know. I'm still baffled. But I think that's that's something which really deserves more attention because if if it's the case that these molecules are have this special electrical property, um, uh, that that for me would be the most convincing evidence of all. And it, for some reason, it's been overlooked. I mean, it has, not overlooked, but I think not not much follow up work. Uh, and so, I'd like to see more work done on that. And, and there are practical applications, I think, for sequencing. Uh, and so, this is something that could get funded. Okay. Uh, here, Marcel. Uh, Feynman uh, used it to say that uh, we really understand something when we are capable to create that thing. Yes. Do you believe that one day humankind will be able to create artificial life? Um, well, uh, that, that could be a long conversation because people use... Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, we've already created life in the, the lab. Craig Venter created uh, Mycoplasma Laboratorium. But of course, all he did was to re-engineer an existing Mycoplasma. He just sort of uh, 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 rearranged the software. He did, did some gene editing, rebooted the thing. So it's not creating life ab initio, not from scratch. Uh, and it seems to me that um, we're a very, very long way from being able to literally start with, uh, you know, a chemistry lab and basic chemicals and put together anything remotely like a living thing. I don't think uh, we even know how to go about it. But even if we understood the chemical steps, you've got to mix some of this with some of this, make these molecules and so on. This whole information side. So I, I see life, the origin of life, as a problem of the hardware and the software. Um, and let, let me just, I don't, don't want to belabor this point too much, but um, I've said life seems like a miracle or seems like magic. Um, well, a computer seems like magic. So if I look at uh, Photoshop or PowerPoint or something, it looks like magic. Uh, now, if I went to a computer science department, I said, explain the magic of PowerPoint to me. Uh, and uh, and uh, if they took the back off the computer and said, well, if you look in here carefully, you'll see there's some silicon and some copper and some plastic. Um, and we understand some of this, but we need a much bigger grant to be able to work out completely what's going to happen here. But, you know, the secret, the magic of PowerPoint lies with this stuff inside the computer. You know that that's nonsense. You know that the secret of PowerPoint, you go to um, a software engineer who will tell you about the code that was written and how it's all put together. Um, and so uh, the origin of life, it seems to me, uh, chemical complexity can come in many, many different ways. But where is this information uh, in, and information management? How is that going to come into existence? That's that's the real problem, I think. So, that, And that's the obstacle to making life. I don't think uh, we're we have a clue how to even go about putting those two concepts together. To me, sounds like the problem as always is the entropy. <laughs> I mean, uh, there is only very few configurations that we can, uh, that can rearrange themselves and replicate themselves while there are trillions and trillions more configurations where simply the chemicals will not react to self-sustain themselves uh, and uh, uh, your your comments on, on that uh, makes me always remember that uh, coming back to talk about information as uh, the the fact that uh, I, I I I want to say I have a two years old daughter and she she has 10 kilograms but she is not uh, 
carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Uh, she is much more than that. So uh, when you talk about the hardware and the software, uh, and in the analogy, uh, for me, it's like that. The hardware is relatively easy, but the, the elements there, uh, the software could be something that we could create based on what exists. But just to keep the analogy with a computer, there is another part that is the firmware. That is what connects the hardware to the software. And uh, uh, there, I think that uh, uh, in that analogy would be what are the rules? What are the rules to, to, to make the, the chemicals in the hardware self-sustainable. Right, right. So the, the, the embryo development, you know, is a great example because you've got information networks. These are gene networks, which genes are switching each other on and off, exchanging information in patterns, somehow coupling to the chemical networks, which cause this part to grow and that part to move and, and so on. Uh, and we don't know what the rules are for that coupling or even the physical mechanism that couples the uh, information networks to the chemical networks. And I showed that, yeah, the radiculogram and the superimposed gene networks. Um, where we can see that it must happen, but I, I don't think we have a clue as to how it would happen. Turing had this model of uh, the reaction diffusion equation leading to pattern formation in a very rudimentary way. But it seems to me that falls into the same trap as Prigogine, that it's not spontaneous appearance of patterns it's the the information is controlling exactly where uh those uh those patterns how those patterns are going to uh develop and uh where the boundaries are and so on um uh, and so it's not it's not a matter of it's not a physical or a chemical process it's it's an information process and somehow we we apart from maxwell's demon which shows there is a link between information and matter we don't really have a, th a theory there's not even a subject area uh which is uh you know where the hardware and the and the software are coupled together we don't it's it's clear it happens in living organisms but we don't we don't have a you can't buy a textbook to show uh in detail how that happens uh, are we out of time yeah uh no it's just because if uh, there is another other people asking would like <laughs> to do one more question i i feel that i'm monopolizing uh so uh but the thing is uh just a, a comment and a question uh, uh one or two years ago i started to study complex system physics and for me it was like mind-blowing and uh, what I realized is that uh, 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 um, we saw a, a frontier of physics, uh, for example, very high speed, uh, and we created uh, relativity. Uh, when we go to very small quantum mechanics, and we have a lot of particles, but all of them similar and interacting in a similar way. Okay, we have we we go from thermodynamics to statistical physics. What I'm seeing, and maybe it's just a naive perception, is that the next frontier uh, that we as physicists, uh, the humankind, looking for physics, the next big next big thing is transpose the barrier of complex system. What I want to say, what are the mathematical tools that we can use when the, the elements are so different and the possibilities of interaction are so different? So when you show it the, the cellular automata example, yeah. for me, it's very interesting because uh, every it's in iterative so every step the dynamics change the rules change so what i really believe is that we are in an edge that we will that, that to overcome that we have to or create a new mathematic methods 
or use some mathematical methods that uh, maybe one folk here use in a very abstract way, but we are not using physics at all right now. Like, for example, people start to use a Hilbert space uh, in, in quantum mechanics, or people use it, the Mikowski geometry in, in general relativity. So do you think there is some mathematical methods that exist and we are not using physics? Yes. Or, or we should create something like that? Yes, yes. Uh, state, state dependent dynamical evolution is very hard to model mathematically, um, uh, a bit, it's highly nonlinear, but there, but there have been attempts. Um, there's a very uh, trivial example, well, it's not trivial, but it's a well-known example from uh, atomic physics, the Hartree-Fock approximation, uh, because you're effectively taking the state of the whole system and using that to update the dynamics of a, for an individual electron. But just if you write down um, an equation of motion for something, where the equation of motion uh, is a function of the of the state and not just a fixed law, um, uh, and you try and solve those equations, it's really very hard. But there has been some work done on it. So these are very unusual nonlinear dynamical equations. Little bit of work, uh, but it, it's a wide open field, I think. And so you can have a pathway. If you think of uh, uh, the evolution of a state of the system, some state space, and it's a trajectory in that state space. And if it's a Hamiltonian system, all that's well understood. But now you can have something that goes off on a totally impossible trajectory. I come back to this idea of achieving impossible states, um, going, going to places that no, uh, in this case, you know, no non-living uh, system could go to. And that's the point about life. It does achieve uh, states you couldn't get to any other way. Uh, except, you know, maybe by some stupendously astronomical improbability. Um, and that's one of the ways of characterizing life. It's a, it's a trajectory through possibility space, which uh, would not arise in any simple closed Hamiltonian system or anything of that sort, or in a stochastic system. It's a, it's a system which is being steered in the direction of new forms of complexity by its own intrinsic dynamics, which is going to be very different from the, the standard one that we've all learned since the time of Newton. So it does need a, you know, a new a new branch of mathematics. And there have been been people who've, you know, done a little bit of work on that, but I don't think it's um, there's much out there yet. Great, great. Uh, uh, we have more questions. Hi, Professor. Um, do you think that the, the, the consciousness problem is the same nature of the origins of life in the sense that how molecules and chemistry originate life and how neurons give rise to consciousness? Or do you think that in the sense that to, to deal with the problem, we have to, to go in the same way to discuss a new kind of uh, way to see physics, to understand um, I, it seems to me the mind-body problem is the classic example of top-down causation, where, um, uh, and, and to give a very vivid example, so the, uh, the connectome of, uh, of young children is still very plastic, and uh, the, uh, the connections between the brain cells uh, develops according to the experiences the child would have put the child in a threatening environment the brain's going to wire itself in a different way um, and so here the local physics of what's going on down at that level depends on the overall state uh, or the same thing we might think uh, you know my my thought i would like to raise my arm you know that's a a higher level concept and it's a global concept it's all across my whole brain it's not in one particular bit and yet it leads to the triggering of specific neurons um, so it's a good example of top-down causation but in terms of it's the origin what is the origin of consciousness um, i usually say the three big origin problems origin of the universe origin of life origin of consciousness the origin of the universe i feel we we've pretty much solved that problem. I feel very comfortable about that. Origin of life, I think we're a very long way still, but we're sort of hot on the trail. Uh, origin of consciousness, we don't even know how to frame the concepts properly. But I would make a distinction between the hard problem, the easy problem of consciousness, 
in the Chalmers definition. And I think that we could solve the easy problem of consciousness in the same way as the, the easy, as the problem of the origin of, of life. Um, that, that we're faced with, a, it's a, the same sort of challenge. But I think the hard problem of consciousness, the problem of qualia, uh, I think we may never solve within the framework of science as we know it. So actually, since we are getting close to the end of uh, of maybe this this questions, eh? I could make a maybe a fun questions that maybe one way to solve the quantum biology problem is for the physicists to convince everybody to use quantum computers. <laughs> yeah. And so and so we would see the quantum information encompassing the classical information, and then if biology is information, it would be encompassed by quantum by quantum physics in the end. Well, it prompts me to uh, uh, repeat the comments of my colleague uh, Frank Wilczek when he talks about uh, life and consciousness and so on. Uh, and he's defined the term intelligence. So this is an intelligent quantum computer. Um, and so uh, so may maybe we're not far off from having quintelligence. Uh, So I'll make mine the last question. Paul, Paul, why do you think that some speculative theories are more well re received than others? Oh. I do not know if you if you agree with what I'll say, for example, string theory, right? There's string theory, I think is well respected. People go into string theory without damage to their careers. Why? Why can people go into string theory and people, whereas people cannot go into the study of quantum consciousness? I mean, I, I'm comparing quantum consciousness to string theory here. I'm not sure if the, this comparison is valid according to you. But Well, I, I, I'd be happy to talk about uh, string theory because some of my best friends uh, devoted their lives to it. But uh, there's actually a better example, a very vivid example of why uh, some speculation uh, is okay. Um, uh, when I was a student, I was uh, really interested in the possibility of life beyond Earth. And in those days, one might have professed an interest in looking for theories. It was considered obvious that life is so special, uh, so peculiar that it's restricted to Earth. And uh, and the idea there might be any life beyond Earth uh, was beyond the pale. Fra Francis Crick said, life seems almost a miracle. So many of the conditions for it to get going. And that was in like 1970. Um, and 20 years later, Christian de Duve, uh, wrote in his book, uh, The Vital, Vital Dust, um, that life seems almost inevitable, so many of the conditions necessary for it to get going. And if you take to an even more extreme example, intelligent life, you know, the idea of uh, alien visitation, uh, considered utter nonsense back in the 50s and 60s, now, NASA has conferences on techno signatures. Um, what's changed? You might think, oh, that's because we've now discovered all these things. We haven't discovered anything. It's nothing. The pendulum of fashion has changed. And I can't put my finger on it. But because I'm a contrarian sort of person, as, as my colleagues have all rushed to become more and more credulous that the universe is teeming with life, I'm now the skeptical one saying, well, how do you, how do you know that? You know, well, what about the arguments we used against me when I was a student? Um, and, I, and I don't know. I mean, it's uh, you, your uh, colleagues here who are studying, you know, the the, the sociology of of uh, a new science would would uh, do well to look at that example. Very distinguished scientist, Stephen Hawking, for example. To my mathematical mind, he said, "Life seems almost uh, inevitable." So I can't remember the exact quote. Um, he wasn't saying that thirty years ago. Um, and so, what has changed? It's fashion. Uh, and so I guess you could say with quantum biology, people are skeptical now, but maybe in 30 years they, they won't be. I, 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 and I don't think there's a simple theory about when, why certain, well, uh, there is a conjecture that I will make, which is I think that some things become respectable speculation or respectable obscure branches of science that suddenly become mainstream because they have champions who are highly respected. Um, 
And so, and one good example, I just mentioned Stephen Hawking, uh, you know, the wave function of the universe. So people talked about that in um, the 50s and 60s, Wheeler and DeWitt and others, but nobody really thought this was a serious branch of science. But when Hawking and, and his collaborator, Jim Hartle, worked on this in the 80s, you know, whole books got, got written. People took it very seriously. Many conferences on the wave function of the universe. Um, uh, I, so I think if you if you have a, a champion who's highly respected, I think Carl Sagan did a lot uh, for the, you know, for extraterrestrial life uh, because he came along at the sort of time when nobody really took that seriously, uh, but he had this sort of charismatic personality and was able to put that subject on the map in some way. Um, don't know. It's a very, very strange thing. Don't have an answer. Well, I think maybe we should close. Thank you both so very much. And thanks everyone for a very successful summit.